there we go. You're broadcasting. That's okay. So you're good. Nice. Yep. So um, just before we get going, uh, thank you so much, Tyler, for being with us today. Uh, Tyler has pre Tyler is a partner at Bolt.io um, and has helped uh, numerous companies uh, and entrepreneurs building companies with transformative, transformative technologies. Um, previously, you've led design and engineering teams uh, with a couple different companies uh, focusing on both hardware and software products. Um, so uh, with no further ado, I'll give the stage up to you and uh, I'll be here and I'll, I'll let you know if the, the screen share doesn't work out, but cool. thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Danny. I appreciate it. Hey, everybody. How's the day going so far? Let me share my screen. Uh, Tyler, you'll just have to unmute your mic now, but it looks like we are good to go. Nice. I'm back. There we go. There we go. Awesome. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks for your patience there. Oh, hey, right. we're, we're in this together. Thank you. Cool. You can see that full screen too? Yes. Any, everyone can uh, make uh, Tyler's presentation full screen by clicking the expand button on his screen. Thank you. Awesome. All right. I can't see you guys, but I can feel you. So appreciate you guys coming and, and listening to this. Um, I wanted to talk through a couple things. I think I have a unique perspective as being a VC. Um, and so I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about um, kind of what we see in the early stage um, uh, investing landscape these days. Um, and then I also have the the benefit of working with a with a large number of companies developing uh, connected devices and IoT products, and kind of wanted to talk about some of the different uh, product development models that I that I've seen um, in the first couple of years of a of a company's lifetime um, that hopefully will be relevant for folks. Um, just a, a a quick intro. This is me um, uh, when I'm not a little yellow creature. Um, uh, a, if you want to get a hold of me, this is my email. I'm at Team NC on most things on the internet too. Like, honestly, feel free to reach out anytime. Um, I try to. I spend a lot of time working with entrepreneurs when they're when they're just getting started and thinking about their ideas. So, more than happy to talk, um, even if it's not like a super super pit pitchy and things. So, um, feel free to hit me up. Um, quick personal background. Um, Danny talked through a little bit about this, um, but for me, I really am this uh, kind of interesting intersection of, of interest and in, in background in engineering and design and also um, kind of the, the business side of companies. So um, I think that all three of these things are very tightly integrated and need to be considered at the, at the same time, especially um, in a company's early life. So um, so it's it's extremely fun to work as a VC for me because I get to do a little bit of all these things. Um, uh, I started my career back at Apple, actually, um, uh, way back in 2006, which feels like a really long time ago now. Um, if you remember at the time, there were these iPod things uh, that were really exciting. Um, I was fortunate enough to work on a number of generation um, uh, of those devices, and I was managing the, um, the kind of the full, the full uh, poor product uh, roadmap at the time. Um, so lots of, uh, you know, kind of high, high volume, high, um, high velocity product development. Um, year after year, really exciting to work when we were still operating basically like a, a small startup inside the larger company. Um, that also meant I was around uh, and got to work on the first generation iPhone, which was which was really exciting. Um, uh, it was kind of funny to see see uh, uh, kind of descriptions of the product like an invention when really this didn't you know emerge fully formed from Steve Jobs' head, but um, but was the result of decades of technology development with with cellular technology and touch screens and miniaturization. Um, and, uh, and, and operating systems as well too. So, um, really cool to be there at the, at the convergence of all these things and really work on a, a first generation product. Um, uh, done, you know, a number of stops in the meantime between, between then and here. Um, but I'm fortunate enough to work at Bolt. We're a, uh, an early stage VC fund that specializes in investing at the, at companies building, uh, products at the intersection of the physical and digital worlds. Um, that's very broad and catches a lot of different, uh, uh types of products. Um, and we've been around now. So some of our early stage investments are really starting to, to, to grow up now, which is exciting. Um, a few of them that you might know about, I'll just click through some of these so you kind of understand the, the breadth of the companies we work, we work with. Um, we're the first investor in Tonal. It's a, it's a um, you know, very large uh, private company now building at-home strength training uh, equipment that uh, you know, can really deliver an intelligent and personalized workout experience and ha has a really interesting business model around selling uh, content and classes. Um, some other consumer products like this, this company, Phi, that makes um, a very advanced um, activity monitor and dog tracker. Um, and more recently, getting into some interesting places where where hardware and, and crypto are intersecting with this company foundation. Um, lots of uh, advanced manufacturing and B2B companies as well. We were early investors in desktop metal. 
um, uh, Tempo Automation, um, you guys uh, uh, may use as a vendor uh, for some folks as well. Um, and interesting kind of IoT B2B companies like VergeSense that, that makes a computer vision powered um, uh, workspace utilization and, and monitoring system. Um, so fairly broad. I, and, and because of that, I get a, a you know, large, like a, um, a wide perspective on different business models and, and, um, and kind of operating modes for, for people. So, um, uh, so it's, it's always exciting. I think the, the context of what people are building changes how they build. Um, and, and I think that's, um, uh, that, that tends to like provide a lot of variety in the, in the, the product development models that I get exposed to. Um, but really, um, enough about me. Um, I, you know, wanted to, uh, just like lay some context, you know, for this talk, I'm going to be speaking, you know, very much through kind of a, a VC lens, but, um, but there's a million ways to build companies that are, that are not uh, taking VC money as well. Um, so I think the, um, you know, how this applies to each individual's uh, context, um, hopefully there's some nuggets in there that, that you can extract. Um, uh, a lot of times you, you might be also like a service provider that's working with VC backed companies. And it's important to kind of think through, um, their perspective on the world, um, and uh, and hopefully that's all that's all helpful. Um, and feel free to hit me up afterwards if you want to talk more about how some of these things apply to your specific company. Um, so first, I want to talk about what the early stage fundraising landscape looks like today. Um, things have been changing dramatically over the last five years. Um, labels have been shifting, expectations have been shifting, and, and really wanted to share kind of what we've been we've been seeing from you know from the ground. Um, uh, one key thing, like I mentioned before, there's tons of different options for people to, to raise money um, and get support in the early days of, days of their companies. Um, a huge trend that's been that's been going on for a number of years now is really this explosion of these of these micro funds that are that are either industry specialized or or driven kind of by one or two uh, kind of emerging general partners. Um, uh, there's just more more. Um, micro funds than there ever have been before. Um, sometimes they'll specialize in stage, sometimes they'll specialize in technology or, or, or industry segment. Um, but likely there's there's a whole fund probably dedicated to the type of to the type of uh, company you're developing out there. Um, so uh, so I'd really go go search, see, search, uh, search out people um, that have a specialization and interest in, in what you're developing. Um, I think the the downside of that is that because there's so many, I think quality can also vary a fair amount as well. So um, so really, you know, take your time uh, vetting partners at, as always. But um, but that's uh, that's always I think comes along with with explosion and quantity. Um, maybe like on the bottom left, there's also, you know, huge um, legacy v VC funds um, with very well established brands um, that have been creeping earlier and earlier in their investment focus. Um, so, you know, there's really been an explosion of activity um, at Series A and, and more and more funds are trying to dip their toe into uh, early, earlier and earlier investments. Um, again, the trade off there is it's 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 great to have kind of the, the you know, the, the, the prestige and vouching for vouching that uh, uh, a legacy VC fund can, can provide, um, and also the ability to have a, a funding partner uh, along many stages of your journey. But um, they tend to be focused on those Series A and later uh, uh, companies. And so the support you get um, at that earlier stages can sometimes can sometimes vary a little bit too. Um, and there's always some signaling risk that associated when people could be a lead for following rounds and, and for whatever reason they decide not to, um, can be difficult as well. But, um, but there's, you know, um, uh, I think a really strong dynamic there of them of them playing in, at earlier and earlier stages. Um, on the right side here, um, accelerators um, can be great. There's usually a focus on education and community, um, which which can be really excellent. Um, but often um, uh, there there can be an overemphasis on quantity versus versus the quality of those interactions. So it's something really really important to evaluate individual accelerators based on. Um, and angel investors are. Um, like have been and, and still remain being uh, remain amazing. Um, they're often difficult to network into and to find. Um, but if you do your work and, and kind of uh, get to a second level um, uh, uh, connections within your network, um, they're they're really great and can help you kind of hit the ground running right away. Um, uh, you know, they can also be very strategic in the support they provide, um, given their operating background. Um, but it's not usually their full time job to to support their investment. So they're available, but they're not going to um, may not be there to the same degree that a that a partner would from from a fund um uh, and then also like there's tons of other options that are not on the slide there's grants there's crowdfunding um there's bootstrapping um so just these are you know um kind of an over generalization but but hopefully kind of a helpful um taxonomy of options that are out there 
Um, so let's talk about what's happening actually with uh, expectations um, uh, for, for an early stage uh, round. So, you know, even five years ago, a seed round was the first, the first money that people raised, uh, a first like institutional uh, round that people raised, like really with a, with a fund. Um, and pre-seed was just kind of a label that applied to any of the money that people raised before then. It really was kind of describing a whole phase and not really a single fundraising event. Um, and that's really changed. So um, see us, what a seed round is today really is like what we would have called a series A even five years ago. Um, and so the maturity of the companies is really um, uh, pretty incredible. Um, in 2019, almost two thirds of companies were generating revenue by the time they raised their seed round. Um, and I think the, the number last year was, was above 80, 80%. Um, and so uh, like these companies are all in market, they have revenue, they've shipped their first product, they, they have a lot of um, kind of in-market intelligence and data that they've been gathering. Um, and so to get there, they've, they've been operating these days for almost two years and have raised well over a million dollars to get them to where they, where they needed to be to have a healthy seed raise. And so this is a pretty incredible change to, um, to what we even saw, you know, a number of years ago. And so as a result of that, like pre-seed has really grown up into being, to being a, a distinct round um, that, that people are raising money on as opposed to just, just kind of a, a label for the collection of checks they've raised um, before, before seed. So if you're, if you're looking to found a company, um, you think you need to be looking for, for people that are talking about pre-seed these days, unless you already have a, have a product in market. Um, if you already do, um, then I think like seed could be a good fit, but you don't want to, you don't want to like mismatch um, expectations for what people are seeing um, when they, they describe themselves investing at these, at these different stages these days. Um, so a little bit more specifically about that, like, what do we expect, um, ourselves? Like Bolt, um, does about 75% of its deals now, um, at pre-seed, um, with some, like, with some seed investing as, as an exception, but we really are focused on pre-seed these days. Um, and so for us, like, um, you know, the, the expectations around like what, what we want to see when we're pitching, um, really is this, is this list on the left, the list on the right, we're not sort of not expecting yet. And it's, it's fine if you're not there. Um, that list is also effectively like what you're working towards for seed and will be expected, um, when, when you get to, uh, when you get to a seed, uh, stage. So for us, we really look for a great founding team. Um, often a complimentary, uh, pair of founders can be really excellent to help, uh, smooth over, you know, the skills and and uh, and, and expertise of, of the individuals. Um, but we really don't expect you to have a full team yet. We actually specialize in working with people to like define roles and hire the full team after we after we invest. So that's really part of the work we're doing together. Um, we look for a, both a kind of a timely and a large market opportunity. We, we want to see a, a, a massive op, a massive market that you're attacking, really see a path to you being a, a billion dollar plus business um, and uh, and have a good answer for why now around a uh, convergence of either technology trends and ideally uh, combined with other you know, demand and market trends that you're that you're designing your product around. Um, that's that's a huge component of, of kind of evaluating the the, the opportunity that, that any given startup um, uh, is pursuing. Um, but we really don't expect people to have revenue yet. Like it's it's fine if you have a chip your product. Um, uh, product strategy, like how it's positioned in a market, like how what the value proposition is to your customer segment, like that's really really important to be able to cleanly articulate. Um, but we don't expect you to have have real metrics around around engagement and things like that yet. Um, oftentimes people do have a proof of concept product or a prototype that, that has, they've, they've been able to use to demonstrate the value proposition, but we don't, you know, expect that to be totally finished and ready to ship. Um, it's important to understand your unit economics, to understand, um, a model, uh, like if you look at your business model, what the long-term value would be to your customers. Um, if you have some early data around customer acquisition cost or, um, or how other products in your category have, have fared in that regard, like that's really, really helpful. Um, having an estimate of what it's going to cost to produce your product is also very important. Um, but we really don't expect you to have real, real data from these yet, um, uh, from individual cohorts of users. That's something that will, that will come later. Um, understanding what your strategic beachhead market as a subset of the larger market opportunities is really, really important. It's, it's important to have a thesis around who the people are that are, um, have the biggest perceived need that's met by your product, um, and how you're going to reach them and address them is really, really important. Um, but we don't expect you to have done that yet and be, you know, having, having signals of traction and turning the crank from there. 
Um, we really are focused on a short-term operating plan. So, you know, we want to see how you're using your money and what milestones you're achieving in the next like 18 ish months, usually with a little bit of buffer. Um, but models of like the giant, like up into the right hockey sticks that show three plus years revenue projections, like those really aren't, um, aren't especially meaningful at, at, at the early stages. Like those are important, uh, later on in your company's lifetime, but you're just kind of multiplying estimates of small numbers, um, uh, at this stage. So, um, really not that important, uh, for, at least for us. Um, so that's a good kind of outline. Like this is a good list of what we do expect at pre-seed and also kind of a, uh, I think a goal for what you should be working towards, um, uh, to actually have a, have a healthy seed raise later on. Um, one quick note on business model specifically too. Um, I think this comes up a lot. I really, really encourage people, um, almost as a, as a goal of an industry too, is to really go beyond trying to make, uh, uh, points of margin on the hardware one-time hardware sale of your of your product. Um, I think this has always been a, a, a struggle for people in the past, and people like I think you know that this is like an important thing for for investors, but it's really really not just for investors. Um, I, I think like people sometimes like try to like think that like oh I need a recurring revenue like subscription or I need I need some other model and I'm just going to try to shoehorn that into my product. Um, you don't want to shoehorn it in if it's if it's not a real fit. Um, but um, I would really like encourage you to like look for op product opportunities where that's the case. Um, it's really, really healthy for you as a business because acquiring customers is hard um, and you want to have you want to have them represent um, a, a, like a relatively high degree of ongoing value that, that you can you know provide to them and, and, and in exchange, like help you know, spend on your customer support team and software development. Um, and really want that to you know, be fuel for your, your company's engine to keep going. Um, that's really nice for your for your customers as well, because oftentimes those models help like reduce the bar for what they have to have to spend up front to like buy into your product. Um, you can take that money and build a better product and your incentives then are aligned with your with your customers to make products that, that last longer um, and, and really live with software updates. I think that's good for your customers. That's good, good for the environment. Um, and so I think there's there's a lot to be said around just the incentive alignments that that um, uh, that are represented in, in those recurring revenue business models. Um, so I'd really encourage people to to, to look at those. Um, and at least for us, it's, if you don't have this, it's almost a non-starter for us uh, from a um, from a business model perspective. Um, there are some exceptions, but I think it's it's really something we're looking for. Um, what exactly that is can can really vary. That can be a product that has a SaaS um, a, a, a service on, that sit on top of the product. Um, that can be a content subscription. Um, it could be could be a a company that has a, a product that has a consumable that, that's um, that's part of the system. But it's really some way for you to be um, interacting with and delivering value, um, kind of in a, in, a, in a financial exchange with your with your uh, customers on an ongoing basis. Um, so to wrap up, I wanted to talk about product development. Um, I think um, I've seen um, a new model recently that I, I'm a big believer in um, that I think is especially healthy for, uh, for, for product development, especially in a kind of VC funded um, landscape that I wanted to explain to you guys. Um, this is like for, for me, like different people have different labels for these things, but this is almost like the textbook definition of a, of a you know, healthy product development process. Um, typically people will, will do kind of a proto build that um, where they're trying to kind of build a fully integrated device. Also, sorry, there's a ton of stuff that happens to the left here that we're just I'm skipping over of all of the looks like uh, works like prototyping, all of the industrial design. Um, uh, there, there's a, a bunch of stuff that happens to the left, but I'm kind of jumping ahead to, to effectively an MPI process. Um, so lots of companies, they, they end up being able to build a handful of units that are fairly expensive because they're using uh, non-MP uh, uh, candidate manufacturing processes. Um, and then what happens is they, to be able to generate like more, more units than that in a cost-effective way, um, all of their attention goes to building, building their next engineering build at a contract manufacturer. Um, and, and kind of the, the tour leasing leading up to that. And that's really how they're even able to kind of generate in a cost effective way the number of units to, to test their product more broadly. The problem with that is that at that kind of tour release point, um, there's a lot of fixed cost. Um, you have to go through a whole CM selection process. Um, there's um, there's uh, DFM and, 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 and the tour release process itself that takes a lot of engineering time and focus. Um, there's often a large, a large fixed cost of, of NRE that you're paying to a CM for, for fixtures, potentially for engineering support, um, kicking off your long lead time material procurement, and, and often like p placing a, a, a P 
IPO for your, your first units. That all has to happen way up front, like when you award business to someone before, usually before their engineers even pick up the phone to like work on DFM with you for EBT. Um, so that's oftentimes a, a problem for startups. Like, how do you pay for that? Um, so then people look like, do we go, do we go try to raise a round at this point? Do we do pre-sales? Um, uh, raising, having a really healthy financing at this stage is really difficult because um, what an investor is, is going to want to see, um, and that's the biggest risk to your business, is that you have product market fit. Um, and then with only you know five-ish units, uh, proto units, it's really hard to really hard to do that. You're kind of selling the dream, but you don't have any proof points around it. Um, and I think pre-sales are also challenging too. Um, it's very, very difficult to cover your cost, product, real product development costs, just with a just with a pre-sale. Um, and so I think that can still be attractive for uh, for kind of marketing efforts and community development, but but purely as a fundraising mechanism, it could be really, really challenging. So um, another version that I've seen work extremely well for people um, is just to spread this thing, spread this. Um, this uh, plan out a little bit and do uh, kind of what I call an in-house EBT. Um, the reason this is different is that you're really um, uh, like delaying kicking off a contract manufacturer and, and trying to go one layer deeper in the supply chain for, for key components um, so that you can, you can really tool something and build it yourself in-house. Um, but the goal here is to take all those units and really deliver them to a longer term beta program or a paid pilot um, uh, to get some of those business proof points as, a, as opposed to necessarily doing kind of a full engineering um, uh, validation like you, like you would if you were just kind of swinging from the fences uh, from the start. Um, and when you do that, there's a lot of, a lot of the, the kind of cost and time associated with going through like full reliability testing um, that, you can, that you can defer a little bit to, to later. Um, all in all, this does take more time. Like all of that, the MPI stuff that we talked about on the previous slide still has to happen. Um, and it happens a little bit later, but it helps you have more proof points around, um, uh, around your product itself that'll help you raise money to get there. Um, so to back this up, like, how do you do that? Um, you need to go like, as opposed to, uh, working through only your contract manufacturer, um, and their, uh, sub suppliers, um, to do, to do a tool release, you have to go out and build the direct relationships, um, with some of the critical components yourself. So you're typically, you know, sourcing a, um, an enclosure supplier yourself. Um, you know, you're, you're usually working with another, with another, um, uh, board assembly house to, to go through everything. Um, but then the power of like when you do that, what this lets you do, there's all this stuff that happens after the 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 paid the the um, a longer term beta um, having devices in the field that are really really important to give yourself time. Um, you want to let your your um, your users really um, live with your device and, uh, and your service over time, um, and have some of those metrics around around engagement, um, how they're um, how they're churning, what, what you know, uh, 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 MPS scores, things like that 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 relate to product market fit, um, and give yourself time to iterate on the software. It's like those those numbers are usually not great when you start, um, and so you have to uh, you have to really work through and, and, and polish some issues before you get things um, into a good place. Um, and then that basically gives you time to not rush a, a real contract manufacturer selection process as well. Um, you still will need to have good quotes in hand to, to pitch somebody, but that's um, but you can still kind of do that in parallel here before before kicking off the vendor. Um, and so when you have all those things, this really helps you like fundraise, not with a question mark, but an exclamation point. Um, when you have all those proof points, it, it really puts you in a position of strength for pitching. Um, and and uh, that's like typically what we where we see people raising a real seed round. Um, and you can do that without a CM breathing down your neck. I think once you've really awarded business to a contract manufacturer, they're, you know, they're basically just like wins PVT, wins PVT, wins PVT all the time. Um, and if you're if you're holding them back to iterate on the product, that can that can uh, start to fray the relationship at some point. Um, so this model for us, like basically everything to the to the left, is typically what we're financing and we're seeing the healthiest companies do over the course of of pre seed, um, and then here and then here where people are fundraising around is is usually where people we see people being well positioned for for a seed financing. Um, and so I think this model is really, really healthy. And I've, I've seen this play out with lots of the, the successful um, uh, companies at Bolt um, where, where they're giving themselves time to really show that their product uh, with, a, with a statistically significant sample of, of, of users um, is really performing well and, and, and in the specific like business model that they're pitching us. Um, so I'd really encourage people to, to think about models like this.
Um, that's it. That's all the time I have. Thanks a lot for listening. That was pretty quick. Um, like I said, if you have other questions or want to follow up about uh, how some of the, the this thinking applies to your specific context, um, chances are that like this is not a cookie cutter um, process that works for everyone. Um, but but I think there's uh, hopefully I was able to highlight some some dynamics that are important for people to consider. Um, thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it. And um, I'll be around if people want to talk. Thank you so much, Tyler. I really appreciate that as well. And um, you can find Tyler's booth down at the kind of on the on the inner edge of the exhibition hall. Check it out.